My name is Dr. Lena Frid. I'm a New York City-based neurologist and clinical neurophysiologist. I graduated from uh, North Shore LIJ um, residency program and the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And your specialty is what? My specialty is a neuro I'm a neurologist and I primarily see uh, patients with neuro Lyme. So talk to me a little bit about your practice in terms of the patients that you see. Um, as we were saying earlier, this is sort of a new thing that doctors are specializing just in patients with Lyme. Right. So I've started my practice about six years ago and uh, my patients came for many different neurologic reasons and now I've honed in on seeing patients primarily with neurologic manifestation of Lyme disease. So you started your practice six years ago and throughout the course of your practice you sort of moved in one direction like a lot of phys physicians do, right? right? So tell me, why did you move in that direction? I moved into that direction because I had patients who have been coming to me from many different hospitals that they've been evaluated at, including Harvard uh, Medical School, including um, any of the big name institutions, Thomas Jefferson, and they've been going for first, second, third, fifth, tenth opinion, and were coming to me and said, we don't believe that this is all psychiatric. I know that something's wrong with me, please help me. And so through my patients, to be honest, my patients have taught me uh, about Lyme disease by bringing in articles, by coming in and me trusting them and believing them and trying to explore all the aspects that, uh, of their illness that they were coming in for. And then I started coming um, to such um, Conferences as ILADS, International Lyme Disease Association. I've been going to them for the last couple of years and learning more about experts in the field uh, in, uh, through this organization. And in fact, this year I'm presenting at ILADS on a topic that's related to neuro uh, Lyme disease. When these patients came to you, though, were you like so many doctors that thought, no way, this can't be Lyme? Lyme, you got a tick bite, no big deal. And yet it is a big deal. It is a huge deal, and no, I didn't. Uh, because they were coming from institutions that I was telling you about, uh, and I felt that patients would not be going from place to place looking for something where physicians were telling them it's only in your head, and if things would have helped them that other physicians were doing for them. So because they were so adamant to look for cure, to look for care, I trusted them, I believed them. A lot of my patients are very young people, active, successful, with everything to gain. Uh, so I didn't believe that they were psychiatric. I didn't think they were crazy. I believe them and I'm treating them. I would think that your belief in them and your willingness or readiness to accept that Lyme is a debilitating disease, that it could be chronic, um, and that it can impact people, especially with neuro Lyme. I would think a part of that has to do with the fact that you're quite young as a physician. You know, you, you've come of age in a different time, right? Yes, that's exactly true. But even to this day, uh, our residency programs and our medical schools don't really talk about Lyme disease the way it should be talked about. It's for the most part believed that it's a very simple um, infection that could be cured and diagnosed very easily. And so I really credit my patients uh, for teaching me about Lyme disease and then uh, going to, to hear doctors speak about this as well. I would imagine a lot of your patients got their information from the internet, right? Because that's where we get everything these days. And what I have been so amazed by is how people are using the internet, whether it be WebMD or social media like Twitter or Facebook, to communicate with each other and to kind of gain some information, to essentially fill in the gaps where modern medicine, Western medicine is not helping, they're turning to the internet. Talk to me about how that has played a role in your practice. That's a big role in the practice. Uh, I think that internet can empower people and so what 
it does for a lot of patients is that it's a tool where they can get a lot of their information. So it's a, it's a very, very powerful tool for them. I think what goes on and why a lot of physicians are speaking against the internet or discouraging their patients is because sometimes we're not using the information that we have properly. We're not filtering their information and we're allowing patients uh, to be treated by other patients through the internet because they're either afraid to approach their doctor or their doctor doesn't want to talk about what uh, they uh, discovered or the doctor doesn't know about this specific topic and doesn't want to discuss it because of that reason. So we're talking about social media. What I've also been really amazed by is um, people who are battling Lyme or are sort of at the end of the journey, they feel like they see a, a sort of a way out of this, say to me, say to my friends, oh, I have diagnosed five people, six people, seven people. I, as a patient, have used my own experience or what I've seen on the internet to diagnose patients. Mm -hmm. That goes to what you were saying about the information that we find, especially on social media, being used as a surrogate doctor, basically. So I discourage that. And I'm sure most physicians do, right? Yes, where I think it's an important tool uh, in suspecting that a person may have, let's say, Lyme disease, it has to also be done in a proper way because people may have other diseases, other infections, other chronic conditions that are going on, and by only, only honing in on an infection that another person has suffered with and seeing it in everybody else becomes very dangerous because you may misdiagnose people. And that's why picking the right physician, having that dialogue with them and saying, could you please work me up for Lyme disease, but not only focus on that specific thing becomes very important. We've heard from people all over the world. I mean, in Australia, in England, in the Netherlands, in Argentina, on and on and on, and certainly all around this country. And they do feel hopeless. They feel as if the only place they can turn is to Facebook, especially, or Twitter, is a community that understands. And when people come to you, do they tell you that, that, the, that they have been able to sort of make their way out of their despair with social media? They, the way I encourage people to use the internet is um, A, to speak to their doctor, have an open dialogue, be honest about what you've been doing. I think for chronic illnesses it's very important to gather information and see uh, what may apply to you and the way you know what will apply to you is by talking to your doctor. So for example, when you come to your doctor and you list 15 different symptoms, the doctor may get overwhelmed with everything that you're talking about, especially if they're not thinking Lyme. But if you're saying, you know, I have all of these symptoms and I've been outdoors and I've looked on social media and some of my friends are saying that this may be Lyme, can we please work me up for that? And on top of that, right, you could take it a step further and your doctor runs a regular blood test and it comes back negative, you could go back and say, I've heard that Lyme tests can be up to 50% inaccurate. Can we do something else to solidify this diagnosis or recheck me in three months? So I like that dialogue where you can have with a healthcare provider who is responsible for your care because I don't think that other patients who don't know the essence of your medical history are able to diagnose you in a one shoe fits all approach. So use it as a tool. Yes. Don't let it be exactly. everything. Right. Don't let it be your physician. Use it as a tool to speak to your doctor. I, what I think is so interesting is um, this idea that social media, while it could be empowering for a patient, could also perhaps make your doctor feel like their back is up against a wall. That, right? That's exactly correct. And I've thought about this a lot. I think that physicians are not using the internet and social media properly. We're reacting to what's going on. We're uh, allowing other people to drive the message that we ultimately want to put out. And because a lot of doctors don't use social media for various reasons, it happens so that we're, from, we're reacting to the information instead of putting the information out for people to take in and use in a proper way. 
That's really, really good information. And I think that's important, especially for those people who are sort of unsure, who are just recently diagnosed or don't even know if they actually have Lyme. You know, it seems like it's this wealth of information, but you're right, it could be wrong. I mean, because anybody can post something on the internet. That's you don't right. know if it's accurate. That's right. And what becomes very frustrating as a physician where you um, align a plan of care for a patient and then they go on the internet or their friend or some, someone on a blog said, well, I need to be on this medication and this is how I got cured. And so they stop your treatment uh, approach and then switch over to whatever someone else recommended three, six months later come back and are upset why I'm not getting better and you find out three months later that they didn't even follow your protocol. So that where the frustration becomes um, very high uh, from physician standpoint and so that's what I'm saying. Don't be afraid to tell your doctor this is what I read, what do you think? And I think physician will tell you you know, I know nothing about this specific thing. I know what we need to do this. I'm happy to look into it if you bring me some more information on it. Doctor, do you think that if the medical community as a whole would sort of come around to the idea that Lyme is a very real and debilitating disease, that if the community would sort of connect, I guess, in some way or acquiesce around this, that a lot of these issues, especially those that we see when social media is at play, would be resolved if the doctors were united in Lyme and how to treat it and what its effects are and if it's chronic and the tests that we should use that ultimately patients won't be turning to Twitter to diagnose themselves? I absolutely disagree with that. And why? <laughs> I think that social media is not going away. This is the new norm and as physicians we need to realize that and embrace that and we need to learn how to use that tool which I think again we're not using in a proper way so I think patients will continue going to the internet for cures for care and uh, things like that however what I'm encouraging patients to do is talking to their doctors and not taking uh, whatever information they get on the internet as face value and uh, doing it themselves. It's the same thing as going to a car mechanic. You're not gonna fix every little problem yourself, although some people may be able to change their oil. <laughs> right, that's a good, there you go, got it, okay. Let's talk about the future of Lyme. Where do you see things going with Lyme as your specialty? Let's look down the road a little bit and, and what do you see for the way that this is diagnosed, the way that this is treated, the way that this is understood? Right. So I think as, as you talk about it, uh, this is a major public health issue. I think people are going to start realizing that Lyme disease is uh, primarily debilitating due to its neurologic effects, not only the rheumatologic effect, not only the cardiac issues that we've talked about, but I think primarily the majority of patients suffer from neurologic and psychiatric conditions that become very debilitating to them and alter their life in a big, big way. So I think the practice of neurology needs to look at this condition further. And the way to do that, in my opinion, is to teach uh, medical students and residents and hone in on them because it's very difficult to change the thinking of older physicians, as we talk about, who have trouble with social media issues and also coming up with new diagnoses that they've been taught for years and years is something very simple to treat and diagnose. So let's talk about future treatments, future um, tests. There's so much discrepancy nowadays, so where do you see it going in the future? What are some of the new treatments that are maybe gaining steam right now and might become more popular? Mm -hmm. So in my practice, one big thing that I think is being overlooked in a lot of Lyme patients, especially the ones with persistent symptoms, is autoimmune dis disorders. These autoimmune disorders develop uh, due to the infection. 
And so in, in the patients who have persistent symptoms, what we need to think about is why do they have these symptoms that are ongoing that may go on for months or years despite of treatment. And that's because we're not addressing these disorders that have come about due to the infection. The way one would address that or treat that is by diagnosing all of these infections. And specifically in my practice, uh, what I'd look for is infections-induced autoimmune encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain. And uh, there are diff various markers that one can use, uh, including blood tests, MRIs, EEG, spec scans. And if we diagnose a patient with this condition, uh, one can uh, offer treatment, which would be a disease-modifying agent, and that's something like IVIG or plasmapheresis that I find very helpful in these type of patients. So you take the plasma from the blood, is that what you do, and like spin it and put it back in? Is that kind of right. the way it goes? Right. Is that like the layman's way of saying it? Yes, it is, and the IVIG treatment, which is uh, IV-induced immunoglobulin treatment. So what's that to Joe Schmo down the street? What does that mean? Okay. So it's an infusion that one would get. <laughs> and what is it? What are they infusing? Are you infusing? Um, Immuno, is it? You're, you're infusing immunoglobulins. So you're essentially boosting the immune system. Correct. It's a simplified version of looking at it that way. Uh, the way I explain it to my patients is imagine that uh, we're at war. And your army, which is your immune system, is now fighting not only the bad guys, but it also fighting the civilians. What the IVIG does is retrains your army from fighting the civilians and just fighting the bad guys. Okay, so it's essentially reworking the body. Yes. Um, what about in terms of uh, Eastern medicine, if that's anything that comes into sort of your practice, or um, dietary restrictions, does that have any role? Anything like that, exercise, I mean, does that work? Right, so in my practice, I think all of those things are important as long as they help the patients. So in some patients, they will help with day-to-day -day activity, kind of symptomatic relief and improvement, and I'm fine with that and I encourage that. However, I don't think that just by focusing on that, uh, restricting your diet, uh, having a gluten-free diet, or just taking some supplements is going to cure people. I think it has to be a uh, um, holistic approach from the, uh, from the standpoint that uh, all of the issues that are going on with the patients need, need to be uh, addressed, uh, identified, and treated at the same time. What about testing? Where do you see that going? So testing with what we have now becomes complicated for patients because a lot of patients, as well as a lot of physicians, uh, are not really sure as to how to interpret the testing. Uh, even the CDC talks about the fact that Lyme disease needs to be a clinical diagnosis, and the testing is really to show history of exposure. However, over the course of X amount of years, for some reason, uh, the testing has become the gold standard. Uh, but even in all of these textbooks, you see that it has to be a clinical diagnosis. If you suspect Lyme, you should be treating Lyme. So the reason why the testing right now is, is a major issue is that I don't think a lot of physicians are aware as to how to interpret it. With that being said, uh, we, it would be nice to have um, better testing with less false negative results, uh, and I would see that um, being as the next big thing in medicine. Yeah, do you foresee a future where Lyme is as common to talk about or to treat as we talk about autism or different types of cancers? I mean, when you tell somebody you have cancer, they don't look at you and go, no, you don't or there's no way you could have cancer, but they do say that with Lyme. So do you foresee a future where Lyme is accepted, if that's the right way of putting it? This is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm giving this interview, and this is why I'm doing the work that I'm doing, is because I do foresee that as, a, uh, as the future of medicine. I think it would be a great injustice if it weren't.